chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. As we continue in this mini-series on the Christian and his battles. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having, your, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that there I may in that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that this evening, though the flesh may be weary, Lord, I pray that during this time you energize our hearts and our flesh, Lord, to um, be excited about the things that we are going to glean from your word this evening, Lord. There may be those who are unable to gather in your house this evening, Lord. You know their burdens. You know their ailments, Lord. I pray that you strengthen the believer in this hour of trouble or even in this hour of temptation. Only you know why they're not here, God. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. We lift your name up and magnify it in Jesus' name. Amen. Seth Brandon, I'm going to need some batteries. We looked this morning about, as we got into the Christian and his battles, when we started off in Ephesians, when you start off in Ephesians, we seen all the challenges that Paul was given to the church at Ephesus about walking in the unity of the Spirit and And as Paul laid all of this out upon the church at Ephesus, he comes to the close of the chapter, really in chapter 6, and he lays out the reality for every child of God who's walking in the Spirit and who's walking in truth and walking in unity. Satan does not take these things lightly at all. So as he comes to this close of the book of Ephesus, the challenge to the church at Ephesus and to the children of God is to put on the armor of God. If you walk in this way and behave in this way, battles are for certain in the horizon. There is without a doubt a fact that we are either in spiritual warfare or we are preparing to experience spiritual warfare. One man said, since we are in spiritual warfare, the church must stop behaving as if the church is a cruise ship. The church is not a showboat. The church is a battleship. We're called to see Satan's strongholds crumble under the power of heaven's artillery. We do not have the luxury of neutrality. We must engage the fight. Accept the reality that a truce will never be called. And God's will for his saints is not that we merely just survive this battle. No. His desire for his children is that 
we will be total victors over the wars that we face in this life. It was said that General Douglas MacArthur spoke rightly when he said, in war, there is no substitute for victory. We must be aware of our enemy if we would have this victory. We need to learn of our infernal foe. We need to learn about how Satan works. When we left off this morning looking at verse 10, he said, finally, my brother, and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. A quick recap of this text that we seen that first, the, the length of the battle. It means finally, this word finally means henceforth from this moment on that we will be engaged in battle. We not only seen the length of the battle, but we seen the list of the battalion. Who was involved in this battle who was engaged in the battle it wasn't just the pastor it's not just the deacons it's not just the treasurer it's not just the trustee he said finally my brethren all those who have been saved and born again by the spirit of god those are those who are engaged in spiritual warfare he also said finally my brethren be strong in the lord you may be thinking to yourself, how was this a lengthy briefing? But as we covered it this morning, that the way that Paul gave this to the church at Ephesus is that it was a present imperative. It was a, a command for them to be continually following. It was a command that should be habitually followed. This be strong in the Lord was, it was so powerful. It, it was such an imperative that it was to say, this should be a lifestyle that we live in a place that we are strong in the Lord. As we closed out, we came to the understanding that though we may live this Christian life, and if we do not harness and grasp the power, the strength that is available to us in the Lord, we will still make it to heaven. But we have failed to, we have forfeited all the blessings that God has for us in this life. And we have also failed at the opportunity to glorify God in this life in the midst of battle. When we returned home from vacation all week long, it was too hot to even imagine eating ice cream. I know that's hard to think, but it was true. When we was on our way home, we was destined to get home about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, and all I told my wife, as soon as I get home, all I'm going to do is try to unload as much as I can out of this trailer, turn in for the night, take a shower, and eat some ice cream. I got home, I unloaded the trailer and took a shower, and when I went to the fridge, my heart was broken. I had three half gallons of ice cream, and they were all melted. This is mind-boggling to me because I just burned the fridge up three weeks ago, and the fridge I have now is not mine. But everything was ruined in the freezer. And I opened the fridge, and it's ruined too. And I started to get frustrated trying to figure out what was going on. And come to find out, the last time that our fridge burned up, I thought I was going to get wise and put a surge protector in. But while Serenity was house-sitting, it's not your fault, because you're here. <laughs> but... The dogs got in the garbage and moved the garbage can over and flipped the switch on the surge protector. That was really frustrating. Could have bought a dog cheap that day. But it was just a switch. This, just this switch is what prohibited this fridge to behave in the manner that it should have been. We have the ability to say no to the works of Satan. We have the ability to do the work of God that God wants to do through us. 
But in order for this to first happen, we must first stop playing the part. Meaning, we must first stop being like a fridge that looks the part, that has the ability to do something, but is turned off for one mean or another. We have the ability to be victorious in our Christian life. We have the ability to be more than overcomers in this Christian life. And like I said this morning, this is not a war between two deities. <laughs> Satan is not one hand on the one hand and Christ on the other, seeing who will overcome. We are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are guaranteed victory. He tells us here to be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. I remember in 1 Samuel chapter 30, remember when the Amalekites raided in and took all of David's men and their wives and their children and carried them off. They were so disgruntled that they began to speak of stoning David. But when you get to 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, the Bible said that David strengthened himself in the Lord. When David strengthened himself in the Lord, the people found strength. When David strengthened himself in the Lord, the men found strength. And when the men found strength, they would go and conquer the Amalekites and take that which belonged to them back into possession. They found success. They found victory. But it was only after they strengthened themselves in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Not only is there a lengthy briefing, but there is an unlimited supply presented for them. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. As we said, that finally means henceforth from this moment on. From this moment on, not only should we put on the armor of God, but from this moment on, our strength should be found in the Lord. I think the biggest problem is at times we fail to see the power that the Lord has for us in strengthening, on our, strengthening ourselves in Him. We have failed to turn to Him as a resource, so we lack the understanding of what he can do in our spiritual lives as we face spiritual battles. This past school year, my son, they had a big yard sale outside of the school, and my son knows that I love tools. And he brings home this whole box of tools, and he confiscates all of the tools out of it, except this one weird set of pliers that I didn't know exactly what they did. I pondered these pliers, searched the patent number, and could not figure out what this tool did. I threw it to the side in the basement. A couple months later, I came through again and found these strange tools. I said, that's it. I'm taking it to work. Somebody has to know what this tool does. So I took it to work, and when I took it to work, I began asking around, and I asked one of the most senior guys in the maintenance department, I said, what is this? And his eyes lit up. He said, you don't know what this is, kid? I said, I have no clue. He said, man, this is a tool. This is the greatest tool ever. I said, what's it for? He said, to do disc breaks. I was really let down. Matter of fact, I gave it to him. <laughs> But the reason it wasn't exciting to me is because I didn't know the resource that it was. The reason that I didn't think much of it is because I've had, never had the need for it. There's this balance as we serve, this, serve the Lord in this Christian life. And there is often the wonder why people don't realize that they have a need for the Lord and then there's this other side of it where people have a need for the Lord, but yet they do not turn to them, to him. Why they don't search for him in prayer, why they don't call upon the name of the Lord, why they don't pray, why they don't fast, why they don't seek him. How do we access such strength? Why, how do we access such power? It's through prayer and it's through reading. This book 
is the greatest love letter from our God. Not only that rescued us, but it has empowered us in this rescuing. And that only, not only that it empowered us in this rescuing, but that the fact that it empowered us in this rescuing means that we should act like we're empowered. It means that we shouldn't run around like we're weaklings crying out that we don't know how this is all going to turn out. We know what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Another takeaway from this text here in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. There is this fallacy that Wisdom, spiritual strength, spiritual wisdom comes from the amount of years that you were saved. That spiritual wisdom and spiritual strength comes from a position that you hold or how many services you have been in. Paul says this henceforth, this strength that will continue to refresh you as you experience battles is solely anchored in the Lord. Notice how he closes verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The power we know is this word dunamos. We've often referenced it. This is where we get the word dynamite. It, dynamite, every time it goes off, it changes something. And every time it goes off, it alters the facial of it. We went to Mount Rushmore last year, and they stood out there forever. I found myself wandering down to the cinema as they waited for it to get dark and so they could see it lit up. I found myself wandering down to the cinema, and I sat down there and watched the video footage of how they made Mount Rushmore. I found myself thoroughly impressed that through the use of all this dynamite, in skilled explosions that they would eventually bring forth faces in the side of the mountain. I kind of tend to think of it in the same way that in the power of his might, that as we experience the battles, that as we experience God's power in our life that as we go through battles and as we go through trials and as we go through troubles and as we go through temptations, as we lean into the power that rests in our Lord, that God will use these situations and through his dynamite power will knock off the edges. And when we get to the end of this run, we will be in the image of his son. When we go through trials and people look upon us and they, and, they, and they glance upon us and they say, wow, how did you ever make it through? They'll see our Savior. They'll hear of Him. Now in verse 11, the command is to prepare the battle. He said, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole armor of God. Put it on that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, society today is not ignorant that there's something wrong in the world. They acknowledge it. They acknowledge that the world is kind of just continually to spin out of control. It doesn't matter where, where you turn, what TV station you turn to. They're not ignorant that the sinister work of darkness is upon the earth. The problem is, is that how they view that it needs to be fixed. How do you fix it? Some say social reform. We are in an age that argues that we should offer the people the opportunity to find new identities, that God has failed to assign them who they are. Foolishness such as socialism, foolishness such as Marxism is brewing in the closet of the world. The chant that we hear in the world about how to survive in this wicked world, the chant is anything but religion. Yet, 
Paul here, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, if you want to have a successful navigation through this life, put on the whole armor of God. As armor is to a physical soldier to protect his body, spiritual armor is to protect the soul of the believer. It was never God's plan to throw us into battle unprotected from the empire of Satan. But God has provided the necessary armor to protect ourselves. I love the carefulness of all of this because Paul says, don't just throw your gear on. This is a deliberate and intelligent process that pours out through the next eight verses. This is spiritual warfare that Paul is telling the believer to prepare himself for before he goes out in the world. There is a deliberate thought process that Paul says, I have armed myself daily before I enter into the world. Most of us probably get dressed, well, I do, because I don't set my own clothes out, but I get dressed, basically, I don't even think about it. It's just there, I put it on, and I move on. But, this process, Paul says that he is prepared, he is conscious, he is deliberate, he is specifically moving through each step as he prepares his heart to engage the world. Last night, as I laid down, Lord told me, your clothes are laid over there on the ironing board, and you have three ties to pick from. Now, you wouldn't find that humorous unless you realized I have like 300 ties, but I looked at her puzzled, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, the tie you wore on Wednesday night did not match at all. <laughs> she thought I didn't give it no thought at all, and I just whipped a tie on. It's not so. I actually gave thought process to this, but just can't match a tie. But as we're going through this, we should intentionally and deliberately prepare for spiritual Warfare. He says, put it on. Put on the whole armor of God. First, we see the purpose of the armor in verse 11. It shows why the purpose of this. He says that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, these attacks are wide range. The entire fall of man really hinged upon two failures, deception and disobedience. Not only does he list the reason, but he brings us to a point where he lists the opposition, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm not going to get into all of this verse tonight, but I want to just call ourselves to focus again on the first sentence of Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, he will go on to define this in verse 12, these four different positions. But they all connect back to this first sentence, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. When we leave here tonight, that is the main focus I want you to leave with. On top of everything that we said this morning, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I was sitting in counseling the other day, and one of the men said to me, I hope that this person doesn't expect me to apologize again. I'm tired of apologizing first. They're always trying to find out whether I'm more wrong or not. They're always trying to make me carry the burden of guilt. We had to go back to this here. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. In this teaching that Paul is preparing to give the church at Ephesus and the people of Ephesus, we must always remember that Satan uses people. 
They are pawns on the chessboard. You see, the desire of Satan is to sink his teeth into the person in front of him to use other people as instruments to cause problems in our spiritual walk, to cause problems in the church. And Satan's number one desire is to cause problems in the church so that we'll step back and say, you know what? Did you hear what Brother Green did to me? Did you hear what Brother Bob did to me? So that our eyes will focus on a person as the object instead of stepping back and saying, what is Satan doing here? Satan wants to disrupt a thought process in us that the enemy is the person, the vessel that is used to create offense against us. Paul, when he's telling them pre to prepare for this spiritual warfare, starts off in verse 12, says, listen, the entire battle that you will face henceforth from this moment on the entire warfare that you are engaged in from here until heaven is all spiritual. He doesn't list a list of people. He says it is spiritual. They are pawns of Satan. They are being used by Satan. And we must never forget that Satan is the real enemy. If we would just approach each situation each time we find a rift with someone in our family or in a church to step back and say I know what they did but who is the source of this behavior we would have a lot less battles we would have a lot less problems we would have a lot less conflict because we recognize the real situation is that Satan is at work one man said about the believer is that the greatest problem with believers is that the Christians are much like icebergs. That you think it's all right and everything looks good. You can see the tip of the iceberg sticking out of the ocean until you get close and it rips the side of your ship because you didn't realize how many things were going on underwater. Us as believers, at times I think we think, we look upon each other and we say, everything seems to look good. We don't know that people have offenses against us. We don't know that people are struggling with us. We don't even know that people are bitter with us. And we we'll never will know until we arrive at a place where we recognize who the enemy really is. Whether it's School shootings, whether it's transgender debates, whether it's kids lying, whether it's backbiting in the church, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. How long is this battle going to last? The length of the battle is from here until the time that Christ comes. Who's the list in the battalion? It's all of us. My brother, and he says, it's a lengthy briefing for all of us because we are challenged to be strong in the Lord, not just a once a week, not facing a battle, but from now until all eternity. We see the leader of the battalion as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we get strength from. And we also see the belligerent opposition is Satan and him alone. We will get more into verse 12 next week, Lord willing, if we're all still here. Hopefully not, but if so, I'll see you then. Unless I'm not here. <laughs> but we'll get more into this as we try to dissect the Christian and his battles. One thing I've learned over these last two months is the battles that... We face the battles that others are facing it just because in a, in a phone call's notice, things can go from pleasantly well to a, a, a month-long investment of people's spiritual battles. I pray that as we go through this and work through Ephesians chapter 6 about the Christian and his battles, that we'll be encouraged to find strength in the Lord. And that we won't be disheartened about the length of the battle because we have an unlimited supply from our Lord and Savior. And that as we go through this, that as we serve the Lord even here at Witten Place until the Lord takes us home, 
that we recognize that ill feelings that we have inside our hearts, that we recognize that mistakes we make against each other, that we don't hold malice towards each other, but we hold it against the devil. And he is the one seeking to destroy the church. He's the one seeking to destroy our walk. And our strength comes solely from the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us this evening, Lord, and I pray that you'll strengthen us. Lord, I pray that you'll give us all these safe travels home this evening, Lord, and I pray that you'll be with us this week as we go out and are a light for you and an example for you this week. We give thanks to you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen.